Dear guests, hello, good evening. And let's get started. The latecomers will just join us. Welcome to the second talk of our cycle cultures, uh, uh, practices of cultural leadership. We, the educational department of the British Embassy in Moscow, are carrying out this program together with the Garage Museum. This is the second series of talks like that. This is basically the 12th lecture. We devote these talks to different practices of cultural leadership that exist in Britain in totally different sectors of culture. Tonight, our guest is the artistic director of the Barbican Center, Louise Jeffries, and she will talk about the history of the Barbican, about her own professional career, and about the practice of so-called col collaborative leadership. So, what is it? How does it work? And what is the future of this practice of management of the cultural institutions? We'll soon find that out. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks a lot to the Garage Museum that hosts us for the second year in a row. Please enjoy the talk. Let's greet Louise. Good evening. Um, it's really exciting to be here. I first visited this city in 1990. It was the last full year of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev was in power. Back in the UK, Margaret Thatcher was our prime minister, greatly admired by nearly every Russian I met at that time, but increasingly unpopular at home. That was uh, 28 years ago and much has changed since then in both our countries. But please don't worry, although art be can be political, I am not gonna talk about politics. I'm here to talk about culture, and 28 years ago, I was here for cultural reasons. I was working for the English National Opera, who were touring three operas to three Soviet cities, Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. I'm also here to talk about leadership, and for that tour in 1990, I led the technical teams. I'd not done this job before, I was appointed to do it for that tour, so it was new to me, and it was my first big leadership challenge. Here I am, <laughs> many years ago. Um, it was a highly unusual role for a woman at that time, especially a young woman, and most of the people I managed were men. But my inclination from the start was to take a collaborative approach. It's always helped me as a leader to admit when I don't know something and respect that others have knowledge that I do not have myself. I find that this builds trust. My job is to hold the vision, not to make all the decisions myself. The tour was extremely hard work, long days, very little sleep, crazy schedules, but I still remember it as one of the most exciting times of my career. Why? Because we had to work collaboratively to make it happen. We had to become the best team possible. And we had to rely on each other. We all understood that no one had all the skills required to do it alone. And although I was the leader of that team, we achieved what we set out to do because of the many acts of leadership from other team members, all working towards the same goal. And then there was the reward of the reception we got from the Russian audience. You applaud better than any audience in the world, and I hope that's still true. And at the Bolshoi, I remember every member of the company, the technical team, the chorus, the orchestra, being in tears, literally, because the applause went on and on and on. And a connection was made in that moment between us and the audience. Art can do that. As the general director of the English National Opera said at the time, the future of society depends on the flame of culture never being extinguished. And 28 years later, I still believe that to be true. But before I move on, let me tell you what I'm going to cover tonight. So firstly, I'll talk a bit about my leadership journey. Then, um, I'll, make the then I'll talk a bit about the Barbican and explain what the Barbican is then make the case for collaborative leadership, and then I'm going to give you five examples of collaborative leadership at the Barbican, 
and then make a few closing remarks. So now let me tell you a little bit more about my career before and after that tour. My first significant job after university was at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow, Scotland. It was run by a triumvirate of directors, an administrative director, a playwright, and a stage designer. They cared passionately about making the very best theatre available to the local community. The name Citizens Theatre was entirely appropriate. It was a theatre for the citizens of Glasgow. They wanted it to be affordable, so they linked the price of a ticket to the price of a packet of cigarettes. Um, unemployed people and young people got in free, and no one would be excluded from attending their local theatre because they could not afford to go. The theatre was a bit run down, as you can probably see, and it was in a notoriously deprived area of the city. However, the aesthetic of the triumvirate was firmly rooted in the international theatre scene, and their productions were in demand for touring all over Europe and beyond. The style was flamboyant, visually impressive, and they were not afraid to challenge and provoke audiences. Here's a picture of one of their best-known productions. It was called Chinchilla, and it told the story of Diaghilev and Nijinsky. I started work there as a assistant stage manager and left as a stage manager. I stayed six years because my personal values felt as if they were in synergy with the values of the organization, because there was a vision I was proud of and felt part of, and because I loved the work we all made together, and because it was both local and international. I was trusted to lead in my area of expertise, and I felt valued. The skills that I needed to be a good stage manager are still relevant to me today. To be collaborative, to listen, to be supportive, to be efficient, to come up with imaginative solutions to problems, and also to be persuasive and stand up for myself. Of particular and lasting value was the knowledge I gained about how best to support and understand the creative process. My next significant job was at English National Opera. It's a London City Opera House, and I was told today a little bit like the Stanislavski Theatre here. At that time, English National Opera was won by a triumvirate of directors, a cultural administrator, a stage director, and a music director. It was an organization firmly rooted in its London base, bringing opera in English to the citizens of London. Tickets there were much cheaper than they were at the Royal Opera House. Its production style was very influenced by the European and Russian auteur approach, and this was radical in the UK at the time. For me, it was like an operatic version of the Citizens Theatre, and I felt at home. Here's an image of one of the productions we toured to Russia, Handel's Xerxes. It was directed by Nicholas Heitner, then a young staff director at the English National Opera. It was one of his very first productions, and he went on to run our national theatre for many successful years. The UK arts world is full of artists and arts workers whose careers were forged at the English National Opera during this time in its history, and it felt really special to be a part of it. I started working at English National Opera as a production manager and eventually became the technical director. And it was the work I did on that Russian tour that was, I think, in effect, my job interview for the position of technical director. I stayed there for exactly the same reasons as I stayed at the Citizens Theatre. I found a document which I wrote in 1992, and its title is The Strategic Aims of the Technical Department. And it starts with these words. I'll let you read them. <clears throat> the document also emphasizes a commitment to team working, the need to enable and empower people, and the value of mutual trust. These remain key elements of the culture that I try to lead in my current role as artistic director of the Barbican. English National Opera has a special place in my heart, and I am privileged now to be a non-executive board member, giving me the opportunity to contribute further to their development. 
My next job was as head of production at the Bavarian State Opera in Munich. This was a lesson in resilience because it was a very challenging place to work in and, and the, uh, the um, environment and the culture was entirely different from what I was used to. I had found that collaborative working got the best results and there the hierarchy was everything. I'm sure this will have changed, but at that time, it seemed to be an organization in which its history was more important to it than its future. And this, I think, leads to a defensive or protect protective mindset and not a progressive one. The victories of the past become more important than the challenges of the future, and the energy of the organization is therefore focused on preservation. I know that my own lack of fluency in the language and separation from friends and family also played a significant role in my feelings of discontent. It wasn't anybody's fault, but it was not a place that I felt I could grow as a leader. However, I want to emphasize that the Bavarian State Opera was very successful in many ways, and I was proud of some of the work that I did there, especially when I felt that I could make a difference. This is a production of Xerxes, not the same one that I worked on at English National Opera. Um, it was almost cancelled. The production teams had not produced the designs on time, and the technical team said they could no longer make it within the schedules they'd set aside for it. At the last minute, I was sent to meet the director and the designer, and I saw that what they were working on was really interesting and would be really radical for that theatre at that time. So I went back to Munich and I persuaded them to continue with the production. This needed the support of the managing director, but to their credit, the various technical teams pulled together and adapted their schedules to make it happen. The production was a huge success and won prizes, and I think there was a shared sense of collective ownership and pride in it. The director of this production was called Martin Duncan, and he was the artistic director of Nottingham Playhouse, and that was the next place that I went to work. Nottingham Playhouse is a British regional theatre. It was led by a remarkable woman called Ruth Mackenzie. She went on to lead the Cultural Olympics programme for London 2012, and now runs the Chatelet in Paris. She trusted me to step away from the technical areas and become administrative director. I wonder sometimes why she took that risk, because it was a huge change for me. Part of my remit was running the finance, front of house and marketing functions, things I had never done before. Her faith in me gave me space to grow as a leader and has inspired me to have faith in, faith in others and to promote people because of their potential rather than because of their current skill levels. Nottingham Playhouse was also led by a triumvirate led by Ruth as executive director, Martin as, executive, uh, as artistic director, and me as administrative director. The relationship between the three of us was empowering and supportive, and we remain friends to this day. It was another place that projected a powerful vision to its audience. It was committed to its role locally, but also looked outwards, taking its work on tour internationally, as well as inviting international companies to perform in Nottingham. And the Marley Theatre of St. Petersburg was one of those companies. I stayed three years, and then I was made an offer I could not refuse. And that is how I finally arrived at the Barbican in 1999. It was initially, uh, I was initially employed there as their first head of theatre. The Barbican had just begun to develop its own curated international theatre and dance programme. And I led the team which developed the vision and content for this strand of work. As you can imagine, it was a complete joy of a job. Everything I loved about the Citizens Theatre, the English National Opera and Nottingham Playhouse was possible here and a lot more. I had room to grow as a leader and the opportunity to create something new. During this, my time in this role, I developed a successful international theatre and dance programme, supported the development of UK-based companies, and began to develop work with and for local communities. 
The program depended on forging mutually beneficial partnerships and collaborations, and the skills I developed in my previous roles were extremely useful. In 2010, I became artistic director at the Barbican, and I now lead the arts teams across theater, dance, classical and contemporary music, cinema and visual arts, and community events, as well as leading the marketing, media, and organizational development teams. It's a, a large division, eight departments, and almost 200 people. I depend on many creative colleagues. They cover a wide range of skills and expertise, many of which I do not have myself. It's not possible or desirable to make every decision myself. My role is to lead on the artistic vision, creating as flexible a framework as possible within which the team can use their expertise to achieve their best. I ensure that collectively we deliver the organization's vision and mission in imaginative ways. I ensure that we're all heading in the same direction and achieve results that our audiences respond to and which make the Barbican the best art center that it can be. I ensure that we remain mindful of future challenges and are ready to respond. And I shall say more about how I go about trying to achieve that later on. So that brings us up to date with my career. And as you see, the conditions and values that inspired me at the beginning continue to inspire and motivate me today. The belief in collaboration is at the core, and that has become increasingly important as our, my remit has expanded further and further beyond the limits of my personal expertise. It's probably clear to you that I like the challenge of working in large organizations. I like the challenge of finding solutions to problems within complex bureaucracies. I like the fact that when large institutions are effective, they can have significant impact. And I like the fact that they contain many experts and specialists, all with something different to contribute. And I like the opportunity that this provides for really meaningful collaborative working. And now I should tell you something about the Barbican. First of all, a bit of history. The Barbican is a unique mixture of a residential estate and an arts centre. It's a utopian vision of city living with the arts at its core. These are the residential towers. And the arts centre is just behind it. And in the middle, you can see that there are public spaces which are enjoyed by everybody. It was planned in the 50s, designed in the 60s, and built in the 70s, and the Arts Centre opened in 1982. The scale of this vision was possible because the area had suffered extensive bomb dam damage in the Second World War. Visionary town planners at the time seized the opportunity to totally redesign the area rather than rebuild to the old street plan. Their inspiration was Le Corbusier and his theories of urbanism. We have an incredible range of spaces on the site. The concert hall has just under 2,000 seats, and the theater has around 1,200 seats, and there's also a small studio theater. There's a large gallery for paid exhibitions, and a smaller gallery called The Curve for free installations. There are three cinemas which show both art house and commercial films. And we also have extensive public spaces, which we're thinking about more creatively than we have done in the past, and I'll come back to this later. There are conference facilities, restaurants, cafes, and a shop. And we have a rather wonderful conservatory. The word Barbican means fortress, which is exactly what we don't want to be. So we don't only work in the Barbican itself, we also work beyond our walls. This is an image of a community festival that we've been involved with for the last five years. It happens in a park some 15 kilometers away from the Barbican, and I'll tell you a bit more about it later. And we work in local schools as well. Last year, we presented over 4,000 events across all art forms, 
and approximately 1.3 million attendances. And this does not include our, our, our off-site events. The range of work we do is extraordinary and possibly unique. We have the opportunity to collaborate across art forms and we believe that this is exactly what many artists and audiences are increasingly interested in. We can bring dance into the gallery, cinema into the concert hall, music into the theater. The possibilities are endless. Our vision is arts without boundaries. It resists the fortress definition of the Barbican. It works physically and metaphorically, referencing the work we do beyond our work walls and the work we do across art forms, as well as suggesting that there might be boundaries we're yet to discover. It also means that we want to appeal to the widest possible audience and encourage them to explore our program. Underpinning this is our mission, which is world-class arts and learning. We value arts and learning equally. Learning is one of the main routes into discovering and loving the arts and into finding new artists and new audiences. And very sadly, we're finding that schools spend less and less time on teaching arts subjects as part of the curriculum, which makes this work even more essential. Here is Gustavo Dudamel, the music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, and he's conducting an orchestra of young people from London. This was as vital a part of the Los Angeles Philharmonic's residency at the Barbican as their public concerts. And here is a picture of our young cinema programmers who are supported to lead and curate a film festival which is presented in our cinemas. The Barbican is an organization built on partnership. There is very little that we do that is not done in partnership and in collaboration with others. Our resident orchestra is the London Symphony Orchestra, now led by Sir Simon Rattle. And we also have nine associate companies, four related to music, three related to theatre and dance, and two who partner us on community programmes. Last year, we worked with 190 organisations across the programme. This brought a richness of voices, something that would simply not have been possible without reaching beyond the boundaries of our own experience and our own taste. Many of these partners were international, as were many of the artists we work with and many of the audiences we serve. Last year, we welcomed artists from 48 countries and ticket buyers, so our data tells us, though I find this one hard to believe, from 101 countries, which is half the, approximately half the countries in the world. We also export and tour work. Last year, we toured productions and exhibitions to 16 countries across five continents. So as you see, the Barbican is a big and complex organization. So what's this got to do with leadership? With so many partners and collaborators working across so many art forms and initiatives, you can imagine how hard it would be if we tried to adopt a top-down style. Apart from anything else, even if the other organizations wanted to work with us if we were making all the decisions, think of the diversity of ideas, expertise, and talent we would miss out on if we did not work with them collaboratively. Yes, we have a hierarchy, and my area is this one here. But responsibility and leadership is widely shared across the organization. And management systems are focused on supporting best practice and expertise at all levels and not on centralizing decision making. The Arts Council of England is the main public funding body for the arts in England. The Barbican's primary funding does not come from them, but their thinking about cultural priorities has an impact on the sector as a whole, and it's important for us to be part of that discussion. The Arts Council is undergoing a consultation exercise to inform their strategy for the next 10 years, from 2020 to 2030. And as part of that process, they commissioned King's College University to do a report on future developments in cultural leadership. Their research told them this. The 
they identified four characteristics for future leaders. As you can see, none of these characteristics point to the idea of all decisions in an organization coming from a single central figure. Aristotle understood that knowing yourself was a wise thing to do. Knowing yourself is about being aware of your own strengths and weaknesses, knowing you can't do it all alone, and being prepared to consider people and ideas which come from different perspectives. Building relationships is about a, um, a collaboration across organizations. It's about trust and building networks. It's about creating a culture that enables people, including yourself, to learn from mistakes and a belief that leaders can be found at all levels of an organization, not just at the top. Embracing change and innovating is about being flexible and the willingness to change ourselves and to change course if things aren't working. In the digital technology tech sector, they have developed a process called agile working. It's an incremental trial and error process. Innovate, test, adapt, innovate, test, adapt. Change and innovation is also about the need to diversify in order to remain relevant if we are to speak to a variety of audiences, we also need to be more diverse ourselves. And being responsible is about social responsibility, sustainability, resilience, and being effective in handling ethical challenges. I really do think these four headings describe the characteristics that an effective and forward-thinking organization should be encouraging and developing in their staff. These characteristics have been important to me in my career in different contexts, and I want to be a leader who exemplifies the values that these characteristics represent. I want to be a leader in an organization that believes in these characteristics. And it seems to me that collaborative leadership is what links all four of these areas, and it's the next thing that I'll focus on. So I'd like to give you five examples of the current and future challenges that the Barbican is trying to tackle and show that a more collaborative leadership style across the organization is at the heart of finding solutions to these challenges. So the first challenge is ensure strategic alignment across the organization and the solution is something we call the incubator. In 2014, we realized that we needed to have a more strategic approach to business planning. Public funding was reducing, and we were getting to the end of being able to reduce our budgets through efficiency savings. So the directors persuaded the managing director, our boss, to second one of us for a year to produce a strategic plan. He agreed, and he since said that he was quite skeptical about the idea, but was prepared to go with it. And I think that his willingness to allow us to test the idea was an act of effective and collaborative leadership in itself. During this time, the line management responsibilities of the director who was seconded were divided between the other directors. And this in itself showed, that the showed the organization that the directors were willing to collaborate in order to create the space for change. And because those teams were now reporting to directors who were not experts in those areas, it also showed that we trusted the teams to take on more responsibility. The strategic plan was produced in 2015 following an extensive consultation with internal and external stakeholders. It looks simple now, but it went through many versions. This is page one, which sets out our vision, Arts Without Boundaries, and our mission, world-class arts and learning, alongside our values. We also identified five top-level goals, each allocated to a director. The strategic plan is a plan for change. It does not seek to describe what we do well already. Its purpose is to identify the change projects which are needed to take us closer to the organization we want to be what we need to do to be an art center fit to face the challenges of the future. 
You won't be able to read this, but don't worry about that. It lists the change projects we've identified and who is responsible for them. And it links each project back to the goals. Most projects are not led by a director, although a director is nominated as a support or champion. Most projects are led by more than one person, often people from different departments, so encouraging cross-departmental working. The projects are updated annually and are grouped under overarching objectives, such as transform our public space or develop a creative commercial operation. These are the rest of the projects, and there are more than 30 altogether. To ensure that the organization has the support it needs to deliver the projects, we invested in creating the incubator. The incubator is a small team of four people who support, provoke, and articulate change across the organization. They do this through supporting evaluation and research, which enables us to learn and improve, by horizon scanning or noticing and exploring future trends, by producing a public program, which I'll come back to a bit later, and by developing and supporting strategic progress within the Barbican. Collaborative leadership is at the heart of the incubator's remit. They are not directors or heads of department, but they have huge influence on the strategic direction of the Barbican and are trusted and valued as a resource for everybody. They're also a key central source of information. If someone does not know something, ask the incubator will often be the first suggestion. So the incubator helps us to ensure strategic alignment across the organization through supporting collaboration, delivering and supporting key change projects, and by helping us understand the impact impact of our work through evaluation. In short, they help us to become the organization we want to be, one that is fit to face future challenges. Challenge two, remain relevant by engaging with global issues. And the solution, in part, is annual themes and level G. As I've said before, having all the arts under one roof gives us a rich resource. However, we have very large venues to fill, and if we are to secure the best artists, core parts of our program often need to be booked or commissioned years in advance. So how do we main, remain relevant? For many years, the Barbican Arts team created their own art form specific programs and only rarely collaborated with each other. We presented wonderful world-class work, but I don't think we made the most of being an arts center. Now the teams meet every week to focus on what brings us together. It's a cliche, but we try to work out how we can be more than just the sum of our parts. This year, as part of trying to tell a more joined up story, we launched our first annual theme, the art of change. The 2018 season explores how artists respond to, reflect, and potentially affect social change in the social and political landscape, and is especially relevant in this period of national and global uncertainty. It's my belief that the arts reflect society and that art and artists help society to understand itself. The art of change looks at that process. A strand of our programme across the year is devoted to this theme, but space is still left for arts teams to programme wonderful events that are entirely unrelated to the theme. So I'll give you a flavour of the season. In the gallery, there was a photographic exhibition called Another Kind of Life, Photography on the Margins. It celebrated and explored the enduring relationship between photography and communities who operate on the margins of society or who openly flout social convention. Part of our film programme focused on the story of women's suffrage across the world in a series of films under the title, Nevertheless, She Persisted. In the theatre, the Worcester Group from New York performed the Town Hall, of Hall Affair, referencing a famous 1971 debate on women's liberation. 
And artist and activist Taylor Mack brought the story of America's marginalized people to our attention through a history of popular music. Highlights of the music program included jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, who recreated the first interracial concert at Carnegie Hall, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic, which performed Jake Hegge's Dead Man Walking, an opera dealing with the ethics of the death penalty. These are just a few of the highlights of an extensive program. The theme also allows us to make a more impactful connection to our learning initiatives and to program more spontaneously in our public spaces and online. It gives the smaller parts of our output more context and more visibility. And it gives the marketing and communications teams an opportunity to tell a fuller and more cross-organizational story. Each month, one of our young poets was commissioned to write a poem in response to something that was in the news, and it was put on our website with a short film. We commissioned a small production company to create films on the subject of change. This is from one of them. It was about feminism and attitudes towards female body hair, and it went a little bit viral with over a million views on YouTube and Facebook. <laughs> Our public spaces, as I've already mentioned, are extensive, and we have good Wi-Fi, so people come and work there like they do at the garage. Lots of different groups hang out there, but until recently, those areas were not seen as a space for artistic programming. We now call our street-level foyer Level G. Naming it gives it validity as a space for art. Work that we commission or produce there must explore at least one of these three themes. Our cross arts programming theme for the year, questions faced by the cultural sector, or the impact of digital culture on the way we live and on the way in which art is made. So here is an image of a collaboration with Sheffield Docfest, a film documentary festival, which explored environmental issues through virtual reality and was one of four installations. And here's a talk we held on the subject of borders. As I briefly mentioned before, the incubator leads on level G programming. It makes sense that it is not only concerned with strategic development theoretically, but also the manifestation of that change artistically. In some ways, level G is the incubator's venue, and it programs this venue by working collaboratively with a range of partners within, across, and beyond the Barbican itself. So the annual theme and level G help us to be relevant by responding to current social issues, tell a joined up cross organizational story, give profile and context to smaller scale work, put our learning and education work on the same level as the rest of the program and increase the creative content on our website. Our theme for 2019 is Life Rewired, which will explore what it means to be human at a time when science and technology are changing everything. This theme was developed by a small team of people who work with academics, scientists, and artists to develop the idea. Suggestions were discussed by the wider team at our weekly programming meetings, and every art form has contributed to the program. But no one on the core group was a director or a head of department. As artistic director, I see myself as a convener and facilitator of these initiatives. The leadership of the projects is shared across the team. The third challenge is develop models of co-creation with community partners. And the solution is the model of the Walthamstow Garden Party. The first two challenges I've described concern projects within the Barbican building. And I'm now moving beyond the building to show you how collaborative leadership is important in developing work that is co-created with the communities, work that is locally based, locally relevant, and locally sourced. Why do we do this? Because we believe it's the right thing to do. A big problem with the arts in the UK is that it remains stubbornly elitist. It's therefore vital that we do all we can to extend our reach to communities which have historically not engaged with the arts. After all, their taxes also help to fund the arts. The Walthamstow Garden Party is one of the ways we try to tackle this problem. 
It's a two-day community festival which takes place in a park in East London, about 15 kilometres away from the Barbican. It's the green circle, and the Barbican is the red circle. We've been involved with this project since it began five years ago, and we're one of its founders. In terms of funding, it's a collaboration with the local council who provide approximately 25% of the funding. Last year, over 30,000 people attended. There were 1,500 performers and participants each day, and the event was produced in collaboration with over 90 local partners. In the first year, the Barbican programmed and curated the majority of the festival. One small area was devoted to the community. Now this is completely reversed. Most of the areas are programmed by local people. This is the entrance to an area called, as you can see, Fellowship Island. There is a range of food, drink, talks and activities provided by over 50 local partners working together in that area. This is a tent which we call Earthly Paradise and it features work by young people and local residents. 16 groups presented their work there over the weekend. The Barbican stands back as much as it can and allows the local partners to decide what they want to program. The principle of collaborative leadership is at the heart of this event. We still program the Barbican music stage because this is where our expertise can add value. We have access to bands which local people do not have. But even in this area, we're thinking of including more local bands in the future. The Walthamstow Garden Party is a vibrant mix of local, national and international content sitting side by side. I see it as a platform which profiles local activity that takes place throughout the year and it brings that work to a larger audience than it would otherwise get. As part of this project, we also run a Creative Citizen Fellowship Programme, which provides local people with the opportunity to learn skills to enable them to take increasing responsibility for the festival. Because most of them are freelancers, we pay them to attend these sessions because we feel that it's right, the right thing to do and we don't want them to have to turn down paid work to attend. One of the Creative Citizen Fellows said this. Arts Council England have identified the need for cultural organisations to work together and collaborate with local communities in order to create experiences that involve a far wider range of people. This is exactly what the Walthamstow Garden Party does. We conduct surveys at the event each year and we evaluate it with care. This helps us to learn and informs our future practice. What we notice as we collaborate more deeply and meaningfully with the local community is that mutual trust is enhanced. At the beginning, the community were, not, were really not quite sure about us. They were very wary. Why do we need you, they said. Just give us the money and leave it to us. Now we find we're learning from each other. We see that we need each other. Um, we each understand the value of collaboration. Two artists we first worked with at the Garden Party have brought their work to the Barbican on level G. This is uh, Numina by Zara Hussein. It won her a prestigious digital art prize, which was significant in developing her career, and the award was something that the Barbican are very proud of too. And this installation is called The People's Forest by Gail Chong Kwan, who is now being commissioned to produce a bigger project based on the themes of this work, the forest and land rights. So both of us are benefiting. The artists gain recognition and we are able to introduce new artists into our programme and both of us are reaching new audiences. Our dream is to see the Walthamstow Garden Party be led entirely by the community without need for our input. We can then shift our focus and support another community to develop an event that works for them. The Garden Party then becomes a model for other initiatives involving shared leadership and co-creation, although the precise shape of those initiatives will always depend on the local context. This work provides opportunities for a wide range of staff across different departments and different levels of authority to work together. Many team members have said that they love working on the Garden Party, 
and offer to work additional hours to support it, precisely because it's such a collaborative way of working and everyone feels that their role is important. So the Garden Party helps us to develop ways to co-create with local communities, support local talent, find new artists to program at the Barbican, and build strong partnerships. Walthamstow Garden Party happens in a borough. A borough is an area of London called Waltham Forest. And there is a new initiative to select a borough to become London Borough of Culture for a year. And Waltham Forest has won the bid to be the first London Borough of Culture in 2019. And we believe that the Garden Party helped them to achieve that. So the impact of the event is way beyond our involvement in it, which leads me on to my fourth example. The challenge is to participate in the development of, cultural place, of, of a cultural placemaking initiative in our area. And the solution is called Culture Mile. Placemaking is a very popular concept at the moment, and I've learned today that there's a lot of it happening um, here in Russia as well. And culture is often a key component. I don't think placemaking can happen without some form of collaborative leadership. This is one definition that I came across. Walthamstow Garden Party, and to some extent our Level G project, could be thought of as contributing to placemaking. But the Barbican is a core partner in a much larger and more ambitious placemaking project, and it's known as Culture Mile. Let me briefly explain the geography. So you've seen this map of the London boroughs, and the Barbican is in this tiny central area called the city. So that area looks like this. And it is, in effect, the central business district of London. And within this area is a sort of car-shaped space. Um, and that, that is what we call Culture Mile. And this space contains the Barbican, the London Symphony Orchestra, our resident orchestra, the Museum of London, and the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which is a conservatoire. And together with the city authorities, we are the lead partners in Culture Mile. Culture Mile was launched last year and we're still in the very, very early stages of development. This project requires collaborative leadership and one of the early challenges was to develop a management structure that supported this. What we did was to develop a distributed leadership model. This diagram shows what a distributed leadership model looks like. Leadership happens across a wide range of areas, and the structure is more like a snowflake than a hierarchical pyramid. This is what the distributed leadership model looks like for Culture Mile. Each organization takes responsibility for a certain area. The Barbican, for example, leads on programming and communications. The Museum of London leads on marketing and learning and so on. And in this way, we pool resources to make something happen that is bigger than any of us can achieve by ourselves. There is a small central team that ensures alignment and leads the coordination of the project. At this scale, it's a new way of working for us and it has its challenges. It requires an incredible amount of communication and time to understand the different cultures of partner organizations. I was at a meeting recently and someone said this, all partnerships have heavy transaction costs. I think it's so true. Collaboration and partnership do not, especially at the beginning, save time. Success depends on listening to each other and understanding each other and that takes time. However, it does enable big projects to happen and bigger visions to be realized. Culture Mile has huge ambitions in the future it wants to build a new museum for London and a new centre for music. These will be world-class buildings conceived as part of their community, fit for the future, and Culture Mile is the context in which they will be realised. But back to the present. Culture Mile is hardly a year old at the moment. As the first few projects happen, the longer-term vision looks increasingly achievable. Here are some of the projects. Temporary installations such as this one, 
or this one make people look at place in a different way. These temporary interventions are part of a longer term urban development plan to improve the physical infrastructure of the area. There are extensive learning programs and family events and community activities. And now I want to show you a Culture Mile project that the Barbican led on. This is known as one of the most polluted streets in London. It's a tunnel and it's right next door to the Barbican. And one of the first major events in Culture Mile happened right here. We closed it to traffic for a weekend and tr transformed it into a sound and light inst installation, which drew thousands of people to the area. And I hope you'll agree that using the word transformation is not an exaggeration. The piece lasted for about half an hour and played several times during the day. Suddenly, one of the worst streets in London had become one of the coolest. And people used social media to spread images far and wide. This event was part of a weekend of activity in which all the key Culture Mile partners took part. We each profiled our own work, but we enlivened the spaces in between the buildings as well. We're all learning how collaboration is mutually beneficial. And it's not only collaboration between ourselves, but also collaboration with the communities we serve and the businesses that are around us. I came across this statement by the former mayor of New York. So, Culture Mile is at the start of trying to achieve this for its local area. Culture Mile helps us to collaborate across different organisations and with communities and local businesses. It helps us to produce work we simply couldn't do alone. It helps us to improve the look, feel and public image of the area of London we occupy and to reach new audiences. Culture Mile is only achievable through co um, collaborative leadership. My final example is slightly more political, although I promise not to be political. Find a solution to Brexit. And the answer, well, I simply don't know. I am being provocative, of course. The arts cannot solve absolutely everything. However, I can't help but notice that the problem of Brexit is much to do with a lack of will to collaborate with Europe or see the benefits of that. And the opportunity to collaborate with the rest of the world is looking to be considerably more complex than those who fought for the UK to leave the European Union led us to believe. Brexit is partly the cause of a breakdown of trust in the UK. Parts of the country felt neglected and left behind, indeed were neglected and left behind, and did not enjoy the prosperity enjoyed by other communities. Some say that this is proof that the arts have failed to play a role in unifying communities and that the arts are just an expression of the elitism that has led to this discontent. I think there's some truth in that, although the arts can't be blamed for everything. It's not going to be easy, but I'm certain of one thing. Collaborative leadership will be part of the answer. In my own view, the offer and the desire to collaborate is in itself an act of leadership. So what conclusion should I draw? Here are the five challenges I've discussed. And what I notice is that we were barely aware of any of these challenges 10 years ago. Even five years ago, most of them were not a hugely significant part of our work. I'm encouraged to notice this because it demonstrates that we are changing as an organization we're looking to the future and finding ways to adapt our practice and to remain relevant. I want to briefly return to the characteristics of leadership that I highlighted in the middle of this lecture. Here they are again. I hope you'll agree that I've shown how these characteristics have been used to find ways to address some of the challenges that the Barbican faces. My task as a leader is to create an environment in which leaders at every level of the organization can flourish. It's an ongoing task that will never be finished. 
I need to know myself and encourage others to do so if this is to be achieved. I have encouraged a coaching culture. I and all my heads of department have been trained as coaches. The whole purpose of coaching is to help someone find their own way to achieve their goals. It's about developing self-knowledge and self-awareness. I've championed and supported strategic cross-organisational initiatives that articulate our vision and bring us together. The Incubator, Annual Themes, our work with communities and Culture Mile all do this and all require collaborative leadership to succeed. When I first suggested my subject for this talk, I said I would reflect on how my uh, own leadership style has changed over time. In writing this, I realised that the principle of collaboration has been important to me throughout my career, and that what has changed over time is the different contexts in which I've applied this. What has also changed is that collaboration has become a bit more popular. Many organisations now understand the benefits of collaboration and partnership, both within and beyond their own organisation, and that this can help to solve some of the biggest challenges the sector is facing how to align an organisation behind a vision, how to devise programmes to remain relevant, how to engage and co-create with local communities in order to include a wider range of artists and audiences in what we do, and how to be involved with creative placemaking. Too often arts leaders and arts leadership has been about the control an individual programmer or curator has over the content of the programme. Are we now at a time when the opposite might be true and success will be more about the amount of control we can share or even give away? When I'm introduced to people as the artistic director of the Barbican, I'm often asked, so do you choose everything the Barbican does? That's the assumption that people make about what an artistic director does. My answer is no, I don't. I have a brilliant team of experts and they do the programming. My job is to set the direction and get them to collaborate. Are we now at a time when more artistic directors might, with pride, answer that question in this way? And finally, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this lecture because it's given me the opportunity to reflect on what I do. And reflection is an important aspect of the first leadership characteristic, know yourself, and one that I simply don't do often enough. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Louise. This was, this was incredible. Dear guests, we have some time for the Q&A session. Um, I have some colleagues from the Garage Museum. If you have a question, please wait for the mic to arrive for us to hear you. And if you ask the question in Russian, please wait for Louise to take the equipment. One, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, my name is Dennis. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, when I went to Barbican for the first time, a lot of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I was shocked and astonished. Main places in Europe, I thought, it's a kind, that was my impression, you know, uh, like the novel, uh, 1984, I thought it was bringing 1984 into life. And the tunnel that you spoke about, and the very weird artificiality, brutalism of the architecture, like cement, concrete, kind of a nuclear station in the middle of the city. I thought that there can't be any life in it, any life for people in it. But when I went there for the first time and I found out that you have a theater, I went to an exhibition. Um, I started in the real state of affairs at Barbican, and what you said is a kind of a turnover for me. Um, thank you very much. These are the flowers that I 
growing through the as that's the image that I have in my head. My question is the following. How do you, you were talking about your interaction with the people that live in this nest from, uh, I, I saw a film titled Barbie Kenya. I think you saw it too. It's about uh, the great people and things that live there starting uh, from the plastic bags and finishing with the birds, the falcons that also live there. So I think it's about different phenomenon and different people that live there. I think it's also quite a weird choice for a place to live in, but very often that's a conscious choice for the local residents to move there. So I wanted to ask you, how do you uh, carry out this contact with the people who live above your head at the Barbican itself? Do you want me to answer each question in turn, or do you want me to do you want to ask several questions? Each question in turn? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thanks for the question. It's really interesting about what people feel about the Barbican and Brutalist architecture. When I first started there, um, it often topped the poles of the least desirable building in London, the most ugly, unloved a building people didn't like. But um, Time Out, I think it was this 50th anniversary uh, a couple of weeks ago, published a list of the most loved buildings in London. And guess what? The Barbican was right up there near the top. So it's a building, I think, uh, and brutalist ar architecture as well, that sort of come into its own, sometimes takes a time for modern buildings to become appreciated. Um, yes, the Barbicania film does point out quite eccentric um, population around us. Um, the City of London has not actually very many people living there. There's quite few residents. They're all quite, the ones who live in the estate itself, all quite wealthy, slightly older. So I would say that's part of our community. So we meet with them regularly. We will do projects with them sometimes, like that film. That was a big project that we did with them. But also, if you just go a little bit further, there are more public housing estates different sorts of communities and we also work with communities as I explained sort of further out uh, an outer London so what we do is not for any one of those communities but to try and bring those communities together so um, in actual fact it can be quite difficult to work with the Barbican communities because it's a very quiet area of London and a lot of people have bought very expensive flats there because there is no noise and they do not want the Barbican to play music outside, to do anything that disrupts them, to close a road, to do a project. You know, we had quite a lot of difficulty with that tunnel project, persuading the planning people at the council and the local residents that it was going to be okay. So we have to respect them, but at the same time we have to push them a little bit to understand that they are privileged to live there and that uh, just because they live there doesn't mean that the area doesn't belong to other people as well. Is that okay? <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Marine. Hello. Um, I've, lived, I've been living in Moscow for a year, and um, before that in Paris, um, part of the team who created the Pulsar Prize, Pulsar's Japan Art Prize. It's a prize um, gathering artists and sciences together to, to make a project. And uh, we are working now to have a Russian edition of the Pulsar Prize. So I was very interested uh, about what you said about collaboration because this is the core value of our project. And um, I thank you for your speech because it was, it was very inspiring. And I was wondering maybe if you could share some tips to create this uh, positive and good environment for uh, collaboration and especially artistic collaboration. Thank you. Well, as I've said to some extent, I think you have to have that as one of the values within the organisation. So you have to be it. Uh, you have to want to collaborate. There's no point in trying to pretend that you do when you don't really. And the other thing, I think, just to answer you simply, to give it, as I've said as well, is, is time. It, it really It's just like a friendship, you know. It takes time to get to know someone. You might, you know, enjoy meeting them on the first occasion, but... It gets richer and richer the longer time you put into it and the more you put into it. And the other thing is to really listen. Uh, sometimes I think that those of us who work in the arts think that we know best, we understand what quality is, we understand the best artists. And I think sometimes we just have to 
to let go of our received ideas about things and listen to other people and trust that you can test things out and that it's not the end of the world if they maybe go wrong once. You can always come back and do something again. So where it's worked best for us is where we've been in there for the long haul, where we've um, not just committed to one project, you know, but really being concerned about the depth and the quality of the interaction. Um, hello. Um, hi, uh, my name is Maya, and uh, I'm film curator at Documentary Film Center. And uh, it is very funny that document um, Barbie Kania film was mentioned here, and it was actually the person to organize the Russian premiere. And um, it's very nice, uh, yeah, that it was mentioned. It is very nice to see you here. And uh, so my question would also be about film program at uh, Barbican, and I very much wonder how you work with students, because you mentioned that you do some film programming with the young um, film students, I suppose, and could you please speak more about the way you organize it? Because in Russia, there is uh, no such notion as a film education for film curators, and I very much wonder how the system works in, in, uh, in the UK. Thank you. Um, we've just got a new head of cinema, actually, so we're taking the opportunity to look at our film program and slightly adjust it. And we've just done some research as well, and we'd always thought that film program div divided into the first-run films that we do, which was sort of like being a local cinema for the area, and the art house films that we present, which is more about the art centre. But the audience told us, no, that's not the case. They felt that we even curated the first run films because we don't show absolutely everything <laughs> and that we need to make more of the fact that the film program is as curated as any other part of the um, program. So we, we are looking into this. Um, the program is an informal program. It's not necessarily film students. It's people who are in their last years of school rather than film students. And um, what they do is that they work with the cinema curators and talk to them about ideas. They come up with a theme. Um, they're the ones who chose the title Chronic Youth and then decided they wanted to keep that for the second year. The, the, the group turns over a little bit because um, quite often some of the older people in the group then go off to university. So it's about, yeah, sessions with our curators. It's about the curators truly not trying to persuade them to do something curators want to do, but a lot about letting those young people come up with their own ideas. Um, and then it's about respecting the choices that are made, marketing it in the way that we would market any other film programme, selling it to the public in the way we would sell any other film programme, and therefore it's given respect. I, I think there's, you know, our... Um, Creative Learning Department also helps working with them as well. So that's about world-class arts and learning, the uh, film team and the learning team working collaboratively together to help facilitate these young people realize their ideas. I can't see anyone now. <laughs> okay, um, hi, uh, my name is Jeanne and I'm an architect. Uh, so I have a question about uh, in 2015, uh, I think uh, you have been worked with the Publica urban design team uh, in, a, in a program like uh, Golden Lane, yes? Uh, maybe could you explain or tell more about how did you work with them and uh, how they influenced on your cultural program? Thanks. Gosh, I, I, I'm going to have to admit there that I don't know the details of the project we did with Golden Lane, which just shows how collaborative I am. <laughs> um, I, I'm afraid I don't know the details of that project. Are you talking about an art project that was there? One I'm aware yeah, of in Golden Lane was a visual arts project, which we weren't part of, which was quite controversial. Is that what you're talking about? Hello? Uh, okay, I'm sure, but uh, in the program, uh, I read in the Golden Lane program in Publica Bureau. It was about uh, 
master plan and strategy program all on all this uh, district um, near Barbican. So I have a question, if uh, do you work with them together? I think, are you talking about a building master plan? Because I think what you're talking about is something that was part of the London Festival of Architecture there. And there was sort of a um, visual arts program that was quite a, pr a protest piece because the Corporation of London, not the Barbican, had de decided to develop areas very close to some flats. Is this the thing you're thinking about? So they lost some of the light that they had had before. So it was a protest piece, but that piece, if, if that's what you mean, was not something that the Barbican were a part of. It was more a response to the city planners. I, and I'm sorry if I don't, if that wasn't the right thing. I just have to admit, I don't know which project you're talking about. It might've been done by the learning team and I just don't know. Um, during this section, you uh, mentioned that you collaborate uh, a lot with young people. So I would like to ask you a question. Uh, how do you collaborate with people who study IT? Because uh, arts and everything nowadays is going more digital. Um, so we're finding, of course, that our website is more and more important, and we've just revamped it. Um, we get very good uh, rates on people who assess what that website and how easy it is to manage. What we found is that, as well, as I said, doing annual themes means that the marketing team can do content on the website that uh, supports the overall program, and they don't have to then just market everything individually. We have things like an Instagrammer in residence, so we invite a member of the public to come and be our Instagrammer in, re uh, in residence for a time. We project those images in the le on level G. Um, but also there's quite a lot of the digital expertise is held within the incubator as well. One of the people who became part of the incubator was, our, was first employed as our, a digital expert. And so some of the projects, as I explained, on level G have a digital focus. Those might be uh, things like the virtual reality project or there was a, a sound project that, that was there. Um, what we have digitally dis decided as an organization is that we don't want one single person responsible for digital. Uh, Sid, who, who is the person I'm talking about, always says that it's a word that should not be used without another word attached to it. Um, it, it doesn't really mean anything unless it's a digital film, is it a digital, um, you know, it, 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 is it a digital marketing campaign? What is it? It doesn't really mean anything just by itself. Is it a digital ex exhibition? We also have this um, department called uh, Barbican International Events, BIE, which did the um, digital revolution um, exhibition that the gentleman referred to earlier. And so that department, which makes exhibitions that tour commercially, internationally, focuses quite a lot of its work on the digital sphere. Um, digital revolution, it's obvious, was about the history of, uh, of digital. Um, and coming up next year as part of our Life Rewired season, as I said, is an exhibition about AI as well. So it's knitted in to everything across the organization and sometimes it will be used as a tool by artists as well. So sometimes people will be using digital as they might use photography or paint or whatever as a material. Other times they'll be using digital methods to comment on something on society. So it comes up all over the place. It isn't in one place. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, uh, can I ask you in Russian, if you don't mind? Thank you very much. It was a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. I wanted to say that you're talking about quite a non-standard approach for art, for an art director, because in Russia, an art director is the person who is responsible for the main decision, like decisions and visuals, choosing the artists, basically. 
for the whole brand. So that's the unique decision maker. Maybe that's part of our mentality too. Um, you know, that strong leadership for some reason in Russia is associated with decision making and also in art. That's also true. But I have a feeling that it's not only about Barbican, it's a kind of a general trend in Great Britain, like people being more and more used to this collaborate approach in directing art projects. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the reasons for it? Do you think it's your personal influence or the influence of Barbican, or it's a kind of the system of value that is values that are taught at school or at the university level? and is somehow transmitted into the society. So how do you think it came around? What you are talking about, is it just your personal experience or is it broader? Is it the feature of all new institutions in London and maybe in Great Britain? Because it seems that this approach drives a lot of results, right? Maybe that's why London is such a leading center of contemporary art, because it's very collaborative. Um. I think there's a difference between what I do as artistic director of an art center, which is quite a complicated organization and demands a different approach perhaps from a single art form organization. But what I would say to any artistic director in a single art form organization, especially an artistic director who, as most do, is also directing their own work as part of what they do, as well as selecting other people to direct work, is what is the difference between you as an artist and you as an artistic director? And I don't suppose there's one answer to that question, but I think it's a question that artistic directors need to answer. And I would hope that part of it would be that there's a different attitude towards the organisation if you're an artistic director, a responsibility towards the public in a slightly different way towards being responsible, especially in a case where you're taking public funding. So you might then have to think beyond what you want to do yourself. But I tell you where I think it's driven. I mean, I wish it was a national characteristic, but I think Brexit is showing that it's really not. But where it's driven from is, I think, as I indicated, is the Arts Council. So that is the main public funding body and it has demanded more recently that organizations, especially large organizations that receive a lot of public funding, are more collaborative, reach more people, work in partnership to develop smaller organizations. So basically, it's, if you don't do that, you're not gonna get the money. So that's, an, that's not really the answer I want to give, but I think that that is the main driver is the arts funding body saying, we expect more partnership working. And in fact, when they first started to do that, um, which was, let me think now, probably six, seven years ago, it was the last round of funding before this uh, round that was about two years ago. Um, when they first started to do that, we used to get lots of phone calls of people ringing up and going, could you think you could be our partner? Because we'd like to put down as partner in our application for Arts Council funding. And we go, what? the nature of the Barbican, because we're not producing much of our own work, is that we have to work in partnership. But the thought of just someone ringing up and going, yes, we'll be your partner, it's never going to happen that way. Because that doesn't feel genuine. That's just about doing something that a funder requires. So, And yet, because the funder has brought our attention to it, just as it has the equality and inclusion agenda um, and sustainability agenda and other, other areas, then people have to start and think, well, how am I going to address that? Because if I don't address that, I will be at risk of losing my funding. Okay, thank you. We have time for one single question. That was rather a cynical answer, you know, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. But I also think that maybe people begin to look at what other people are doing and then realize that there's something in this and that there is a sort of moral imperative as well. As I said, you know, people from communities that don't engage in the arts also pay taxes and some of those taxes are taxes that go to paying for the arts. So there's a moral imperative that I think people are more aware of as well. I would add that. 
Okay, um, many thanks for your incredible lecture. My, ha my question is about um, the way you measure success. Yeah. Like, is it something in the system that is required by the Arts Council or you have your own system? And the second question is that during the lecture, you've laid out a number of challenges that you were facing and to which you found answers. What are the new challenges that keep you up at night that you are thinking about and for which you need to find answers? Thank you. Um, evaluation is required by the Arts Council, yes. And actually, I said that our main funder is not the Arts Council, but we get Arts Council funding for the work that we do off-site. So all that Walthamstow Garden Party is you know, dependent on Arts Council funding. Um, so we have people literally with questionnaires. We have marketing organisations that will analyse the data that we have. So it'll be qualitative and quantitative um, evaluation on those projects, which is really important, especially if it's a change project, because that brings us, gives us the information to let us know if something's working and where we have to adjust and, and change. And it makes us set targets as well. We also work very closely with the Guildhall School of Music and Drama next door to us, and they have a more academic um, research department. So we might be doing some evaluation, but they might also have academics working in a more general terms on, on research questions as well. What are the challenges for the future? Well, I think that we are told that there's no prospect of further funding. So um, a broader range of funding, I think. Uh, I've heard today some really impressive stories about organizations here that are getting um, funding, not, not public funding, funding from other sources. And we haven't necessarily been terribly good at that, um, certainly across the country. But we're going to have to find different ways to fund. I mean, it had, the Barbican, for example, um, a few years ago, had 60% of its funds from the City of London and 40% it earned itself. Now, 38% of the funds come from the City of London and the rest we have to earn ourselves. So it's a big change and it's not going to go in the other direction. Um, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is I think um, someone was saying um, this to me yesterday or earlier today, that um, people are more and more interested in process as well. So I think there's a, something about artists and arts organisations opening up to the public about what the process of creating art is and letting people in to see that process and understand that process a bit more. What else? I mean, I still think huge challenge with equality and inclusion on every level, whether it be about ethnicity, whether it be about gender equality, certainly most of the uh, big arts organisations in the UK are still run by men, white men, uh, about disability, so that is still something that we haven't done enough about, that will remain a huge challenge, reaching um, more people. And about, um, there's a lot of, the placemaking thing I think will go on and on and on, and actually I think that's a very um, useful conversation because if we can start researching that and be proving that culture makes a place a better place to live and then in, it contributes to people's health, reducing crime rates, etc. It's not going to solve all those things, but if it begins to help the character of a place become more livable, if you like, then that's a very good argument for cultural funding to maybe come from other departments apart from the culture, culture department. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's quite a few. <laughs> I think this will be it. Let's say thank you again to Louise for what she did.